Okay, we can start. Any questions? Even in Italian? Curiosity? Complaints? Okay, so last time uh, we were talking about uh, Pang Chung's, so I recap a little bit what we have said. So functions, the most important point, of course, not everything, but the, the most important point is the function definition. So you have uh, uh, a number of instructions that you probably will want, uh, want to use many times in during the during program, so you can drop all this instruction inside a function. So uh, a function would consist of a starting declaration with the def keyword, then followed by the name of the function that you want. You can choose any name you want. Then a uh, parenthesis, and inside the parenthesis, you can put some num a number of argument to the possible argument of the function. Then you uh, hand the declaration of the function with a column symbol. Then you have the body of the function. Uh, you must take care so that the body will be indented respect, with respect to the definition of the function itself. So, uh, as I told you, indentation is a uh, part of the syntax of the language. It must be done carefully. And then eventually the, the, the function, it usually does, but eventually returns some value, but uh, calculate, for instance, with return fact, uh, there is a variable fact which is defined inside the body of the function, and this is returned by the function. So you call the function, and uh, at the end you get a value, which is the, comp the computation of the function itself. Then I told you something about the fact that a uh, function can foresee, for instance, a function definition can foresee a number of possible keyword uh, value. So uh, in this case, for instance, you have a, your function that calculates the factorial of a number. It, pro, uh, it requests uh, 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 a number to, to, to be for the factorial. We have to compute the factorial of the number n. So this is a mandatory argument. n must be present in the, when, in, at the time of the function call. But there is an also argument, uh, argument here, which is a keyword argument. This is optional. It is called prn. And by default, it is uh, uh, equal to false. So if you run the function without specifying the value of PRN, then uh, it is assumed to be false. Otherwise, you can change it to true, for instance, and the function will do something else according to the value of this keyword argument, which is used in this conditional evaluation. Then, as I told you last time, it is important to document your functions in a way like this one, for instance. It's not the only possible way to document your function, but it is particularly useful if we want to use, for instance, the uh, Sphinx uh, package that uh, uh, provides you the possibility to um, build a uh, uh, some uh, internet size on which your documentation is loaded with some formatting convenient formatting and you can also assess uh, from can I, may I ask yeah you? yeah if I had some comment just with the hashtag yeah this cannot be read unless I open the the code yes file. yes yes okay. if, you, if you write here any things like starting with this symbols this is a comment, this is not really unless you open the code. The, the code. <clears throat> and uh, it could be it's useful to, to, to write comments, but uh, depends. Well, <clears throat> in, the, in the old school of programming, uh, all, uh, every information technology people would say to you that uh, it is useful to insert comments to explain what the function does. So it, it would be useful to, to, to write comments in the preceding by the hashtag. Um, 
other people say that no, it is not useful. If you have to write a comment, that's mean to explain what the function does. It means that the function is not written properly. Uh, a function should be written in such a way it uh, speaks about itself. So you go through the function, you must understand immediately uh, or intuitively, if you know, if you want, uh, what the function does. If you need to put some comments, it's because the function is not well written, so you don't understand what uh, uh, it is doing unless uh, you read the comment. So uh, there are people that say, no, don't lose time to write comments. Uh, take your time to write better functions, so better written functions. So they, they comment themselves. If you, so I, I generally don't write comments now. <laughs> I try to follow this rule. Uh, to, to, to write better, better, better programs, better coding. Anyway, this is another thing. Anyway, this is not a comment. This is just a, an help for uh, users. Uh, what's the meaning of the parameters that I have to put in the, in, the, in, the, in the function and what I expect the function returns when I call it. So you can assess the um, uh, documentation uh, even online by uh, writing this help. Help is a built-in function of, uh, uh, of Python. So uh, if you run help factorial, it will go to the your namespace to find to find for a function which is called factorial and uh, uh, search inside uh, the function itself to look for strings like this one and then print the uh, the documentation. And here is our function for calculating the factorial with uh, some help. Then I told you something about recursive, recursion. Uh, there is a very simple example here uh, of using re uh, this recursive function that call, it, call itself. And uh, we will use some example later on uh, this use, this, te this technique, this recursive techniques. Then we also see that we have the possibility to write function that uh, returns not just one value, but more values. For instance, a list of values of three scalars number. And we use the, we see how, how to use them. Then a little add to the uh, notebook that uh, I was running yesterday. I, this morning I add this uh, uh, few lines more. Um, you can insert in the uh, definition of, of your function not, for instance, not a return the, uh, a statement. Uh, this is a very simple function that uh, uh, compute the square of a number. So I define the func function yield, gave this name here, and generally one writer, function yield x, x is the argument, take the square of y, of x, and, and, and uh, you get the number y, then uh, return y. So if I run the function that way, um, uh, I get the, uh, the square of the number I, I, I gave an input. So if I write x equal to 2, uh, I will get uh, 4. If you, instead of return, you here write yield, you don't have um, back a number, but you have got back a generator. So if I run this cell here, now the function is defined. Now I call the function yield with the argument three, and I store the results in this uh, symbol f, in this variable f. Then I print f and the type of f. And you see that the result is not nine, and then the, the computation of the square root of three should be nine, but I don't get nine. I get this f, which is a generator object, of the class generator, so an instance of the class generator, and I can use f to generate the results uh, of the uh, calling this function with argument three. So if I run list f, I use the generator to get the value of the function with the argument three, and I got nine. So <clears throat> instead of uh, uh, getting numbers, or getting value from this, the, the function, I get a generator for uh, generating uh, this number. It seems not so useful, not so exciting, but we will problem. I don't know if I will have time, but I will uh, uh, show you an example uh, how this can be useful in some situation. 
anyway you can find this uh, definition in other in, in in program written by other people so you know that uh, what yell does is returning a generator and not just a number now <clears throat> Starting the arguments of a function. Many times you look for code to code written by others, and you see that the arguments are uh, to a function are preceded by a star. So, and they say that the argument has been started. So, starting the argument of a function. You do that any time that you don't know exactly what will be the number of arguments that you provide. You will provide to your function at the time of the call. So I define this my uh, my function with star val. I run it, and what this function does is very simple. Sorry, I have to run it. Very simple. <clears throat> Take a number of arguments and sum them. So <clears throat> I uh, create a variable s equal to zero at the beginning. So I initialize a variable with the number zero. Then I go through the value which are stored in this val. It can be a single number or can be a list of number. Not written as a list, but written as, um, as a sequence of value. There will be stored in the value, uh, in the val list. And for IV, this uh, uh, variable of the cycle, this is a four cycle, for this IV running from 0 to all the value that you have in val, make the sum to S. So I redefine S as the sum of S plus IV. And so that's, that's the summation of all the value that I have in val. And then the function return the sum, return S. So if I use it, my sum 1, 2, 3 will sum 1 plus 2 plus 3, that is 6. And you see that now I have three arguments, but I can also have some only two uh, value, so four and five. So I can run this one, it works the same. So it's some four to five. So I don't have to specify the length, the, the number of <clears throat> arguments that I will provide in this list val. I can just put a star here. Very useful because many times you write function uh, uh, for which the number, the number of argument can change at the time of the function call. So um, you write a star here. But we have <coughs> to take care of some of something. For instance, you have a, a function uh, very similar to the previous one <coughs> with two arguments, the B argument and the val, which is uh, a star here. So B is just a number, single number. Val can be any number. So it can, can be a list of uh, several numbers. I can um, run the function. And what happened here is that I sum all the argument, which are some of the numbers that are contained in the val list, it's the same, just the same as before. But then the function returns s times b. So makes a multiplication of the sum for the number b and returns the value. So I write here my sum 2, 2, 3, pi. Now, the first two is this b value here, and 2, 3, 5 is the number that which are, will be stored in the val list. So I can run this cell, and I go 20. 2 um, uh, plus 3 plus 5 is 10, and this 10 is multiplied by 2. So I got 20. That's very simple. Now look at this other uh, definition. Seems similar to the first one. Where, but I switch the position of the two arguments. I start. I, I write before val with the star and then b. No problem at the time uh, of the definition of the function. So I, as you see, I click it on this run button. It go uh, no error. I got no error. So the function has been accepted. It's been checked because the interpreter when you uh, write a function um, and um, uh, start uh, and you write, call the function, you define the function, must, uh, uh, the interpreter uh, does some check in the function itself to see if there are obvious errors. For instance, if uh, I write this S here this way, not properly indented, and I run, I got an error, an expect indent. So uh, the interpreter is making some check of the function. 
I defined my function, I got no error for the interpreter, so for the interpreter this is quite okay. But <clears throat> what happened when I um, call this function at, uh, at runtime? So I, am, I have defined the function, I call with this two with list of uh, uh, number. The same list as before, I have two free phi which are assigned to val star that were in the last position in the in the uh, previous definition of the function and the two which is the b the last two is is uh, we intended is the b the b that we used before in this position now we specify the b at the end then run and we got an error and, uh, and the error is my sum is missing one required keyword only argument b why it's happened because written uh, by writing this way the argument uh, and then passing to the function this argument the function has not the possibility to distinguish the fact that this last two is our b value because we have val with a star so val can uh, uh, can have any length for instance also a length of four arguments four numbers so the uh, the interpreter understand that this two three five and two will be argument of the val, of the star val argument. They are all numbers uh, belonging to val. And as for b, now, we pass all this val value, but we forget, for, for the, uh, we forgot for the interpreted uh, understanding, the value of b, and says, all right, uh, I, you gave me uh, four values for the val list, but uh, I forgot to uh, provide B the argument B, which is seen as a keyword only argument. So uh, we can write uh, this function, in, we can call this function this way, it, it will work fine. Um, in this case, um, in this definition, in, in, in fact, we, when we write this, uh, this definition, the interpreter understands that this p is a keyword value, uh, keyword value for which we have not provided any default. We could provide some default by putting uh, a number, for instance, here. But the, uh, if we don't write any default, the, the, the interpreter understands that this p, after the starting, uh, the started uh, val, will be a keyword um, argument for which a keyword was not provided. We can provide now a number for B, and then the, uh, the, the interpreter is quite happy because he, he understand in this, uh, in this calling that two, three, and four, and five will be the uh, number uh, contained in val, and B is our keyword argument containing the two. And so uh, might make this, so we'll make the sum two plus three plus five, which will be 10, and multiply the result by uh, two as uh, is in the definition uh, as it is required in the definition of the function. Okay, uh, there are other possibilities to write the same thing without using um, a star in front of bar. I um, ask you again if you have questions, stop me and ask. Uh, there's, there's no meaning if uh, we go on if you don't understand everything. So stop me. Uh, anytime and ask for uh, explanations. So, <clears throat> here we use the star. We can do uh, something different, for instance. We can uh, do the same thing by using uh, uh, another um, implementation of the function. In this way, uh, I define my function uh, with val, now val, could be a single number or could be uh, a list um, of numbers and a uh, factor uh, equal to is a, a default is, is, is a keyword argument with a default which is equal to two now I put some uh, conditional evaluation in the body of the function to understand what val is because if val is a list the function must work in some way uh, if the function if the value is not a list but a single value, uh, it should work in a different way in order to, to, to provide the result, the correct result.
So if type of val is a list, so type val equal to list will be uh, evaluated. This is a Boolean evaluation, this is a test evaluation, and will return true or false. And if val is, a, is a, of type list, then it will be a list. And the conditional evaluation will say, all right, this is true because val is a list. So perform this calculation. Perform the res compute the results and put the, the, um, the, the uh, results of the function uh, in the result list by using list comparison. So I, I, I write here this, uh, this um, structure, which is a list comparison. So I start with the square brackets. And inside the square bracket, I compute the list in this way. Factor, our factor, which by default is equal to 2, times IVAL. And IVAL is the variable that uh, go from 0 to, not from 0, from uh, all the, 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 the number which are stored in the VAL list. List comparison. So at the, at the end, I will get every... Um, uh, number in the list val multiplied by the factor equal to 2 and the result will be stored on the, um, uh, in this variable result which will be a list as if this uh, test is false so val is not a list but is a single number just multiply factor uh, for this um, uh, single number and put the result in the variable result then return results. So I can call this function in different way. I can call this function, with, for instance, by providing an argument, which is 2. Now I run the function. I call this function. And the result is 4. Because 2 is a single value. So type val is false. This is, will be the, um, the, the operation, the instruction that will be executed by the function itself. Multiply factor, which is equal to 2 for the number we, provide, we provided, which is 2. So 2 times 2 is 4. That's the result. But I can call the function with the list instead of a single number. And the result is a list now, because I provide a list here. Uh, as I provide a list as an argument, a, 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 each element of the argument will be multiplied by the factor, which is 2. And we we'll get this one. Of course, we can also call... Uh, the function with a different factor, factor equal to 3, and what we get is 6, 9, 15, because we multiply 3 for all the number containing this way. There's a little different in this implementation with respect to the other in the implementation with the star, because if we use uh, the star uh, instead of uh, uh, for uh, prefixing the star symbol with to, to val, what we provide val is not written in the form of a list. We provide the numbers, three, 2, 3, and 5, not enclosing a list. We provide single value for this value b, for the value uh, um, containing in val, 2, 3, and 5. They are not enclosing in a list. In this way, uh, instead, val is a list. So when we uh, call the function, we have to provide a list, not um, not uh, separated numbers. Just to see what happened by using this function in this way, we got an error. Multiple values for argument factor. Uh, what happened here? This is very rather mysterious um, uh, error. But why the interpreter put out this? A strange error message. My func got multiple values for argument factor. Why? We put factor equal to 3. Not multiple value for factor. So what the hell is the problem with factor? Well, the problem is that <clears throat> the function expects two arguments, a list or at, or at most a single number, so and this value is a, this value is a single object could be a list and uh, um, a, or a, a, a single value and factor equal to two. So the function expect two argument, not more than two argument. And what happened here? 
the, the interpreters start to read uh, the, um, uh, the argument that you uh, uh, pass it to my func. So make the parsing, it's called the technical term, it's the parsing of the argument. And says, okay, we have a two, so this two is not a list. Could be the value of ball. The second um, uh, number that uh, it find in the in this uh, list of argument is three. That should be the, the value of factor. Even if the, uh, it is a keyword uh, uh, argument, you can call it without providing the keyword name. Uh, so it, uh, you write three is a uh, uh, is a factor. Is a number for factor. Then it's on uh, phi and another factor equal to three. So it says, all right, I, I got too many value for factor because this phi and this factor equal to three are understood as um, value for factor. So he print out an error message that uh, concerns the factor argument. But factor argument has no fault. It's not a problem of factor. The problem is that I should write here a list and not single values separated by commas. And so it worked currently. Now the, uh, the, the interpreter understands, all right, this is a list, this is val, and then we have factor equal to three. Okay, this is our keyword argument, and it worked probably. So error message, that's the take home messages here, is that the error message cannot be, uh, are not generally not so clear. Uh, it's dependent by the arrows you make, and the, end, the, 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 the interpreter understands things uh, in different in ways, in general different ways from the, the human, uh, or from the programmers. So you have to take to read uh, um, very carefully the error message, and you can try to understand uh, what the interpreter want to communicate to you, which is not always so uh, so easy. So, no, saying so much easier if NumPy is used, okay? We, I, I do the same thing by using NumPy. Um, uh, with NumPy, I don't have uh, um, problems uh, I distinguish between a list or, or um, a single value for the val variable. I can provide my um, function with an array, uh, val, instead of a list, or with single um uh, single values doesn't make any difference. I just take the multiplication between val and factor, and this multiplication is done properly, no matter if val is a list or uh, is an array instead, uh, or uh, um, a single scalar. So if I run the function here, I uh, with x equal to, and I uh, define x equal to an array. Then I can call my function with the array x or with the single number phi, and the result is is okay. Okay, I got four, six, ten. These two, three, five multiplied by two in one case. So this print x fun, print my func x is equal to this list. In fact, it's not a list here, but this is an is an array. And uh, an umpire array, and in the other case, the second case, I provide my function with a single scale of five, and I got ten as a result. This worked because x is an array, but if I call this uh, same function uh, with a list instead of an array, so this I do that. So I don't define x is an array, but I define x is a list. And I pass my um, argument x to the, my function defined this way. What happened is this strange thing. Why? Why this is a list? And what happened when I multiply a list by a number? In this case two. This uh, this is not the element-wise um, multiplication as NumPy does. This is just the concatenation of the list val with itself twice. So, 2, 3, 5, one the first time, then it is multiplied by 2, so I concatenate by, with itself, and I got 2, 3 times again. So I got a list of 6 member, um, uh, in this case, we are repetition, twice repetition of this uh, original list. So, uh, 
the function behaves in a strange way if you uh, it does not do what, what you want uh, in case you provide uh, a variable as argument which is not the expected one. So I organize here the number as in a list, in a Python list, and not in a, a NumPy array, and the results are different. It's OK. Now, lambda functions, that's an important, important point. <clears throat> lambda functions are. Uh, other uh, can, they can be called, can be named also anonymous functions. They are nameless functions, functions having no names. Uh, construct of the lambda, they are very useful in many situations. We will see probably some example. Um, you define uh, this construct here. You define a lambda function. Lambda is just the anonymous name. In this way, you uh, I uh, have to write the keyword lambda, then provide the argument of lambda. Could be one arg number, a list, uh, or um, more argument uh, in some ways. And so, but here is a very simple construct that uh, I provide a, a number x, maybe, number x, maybe, to the sound function. Then you have a column, and then some simple algorithm involving x, not just this uh, complicated uh, uh, function, but just some, for instance, statement or just an, a, a very short elaboration with take one row only. So your function should be containing one row only. And this, of course, should um, involve the variable x that you provide uh, as argument to the function. So x is argument to the function. It is used. Uh, by the uh, body of this lambda function and then returned. For instance, I can um, write this line. Of, what is returned is not is not uh, um, um, a, a value. It is it, it is returned to the function. That's that's a tricky thing. So, but we will see here in example. I write this f equal to lambda uh, x colon s square. So. Um, this uh, lambda function make the square of the um, uh, of a number that you provide as argument, and you assign the result to this variable f. But look at what is f by type f. F is not a number. In fact, I call um, um, this lambda numerous function, but I do not provide a value for x. I just uh, write this expression, and I don't put any uh, value for x. x is a variable, is the argument our function. It will be elaborated, but um, I do not provide value for x. So f cannot be any number. should be something different, because how to compute this uh, value of x if you don't know the value, the, the value of x squared if you don't know the value of x? We don't provide any value for x. But this um, construct will return a function, and this function will be assigned to the variable f. So the type of f is a function. And now I can call f with some argument. If this argument I, uh, I provide this number 5 here will be uh, passed to this x, and the um, uh, square of this f will be this x will be performed and return this will be returned so f of 5 is 25. so we can write another uh, number just to, to the, for demonstration you can write uh, 7 and i got of course 49. so this lambda function the construct is very useful in many situations and uh, return of this construct is a function uh, the lambda function can definition can contain, as I told you before, uh, more than one argument. For instance, this is a lambda function containing two arguments, x and y, and colon. So here, this is the um, definition of the lambda function, and here this is the body. Just make the uh, multiplication uh, between these two values. So I define the function, and then I uh, <coughs> run it f2 and 3, 6. Very simple. Now, 
I give you one uh, minute to understand what this uh, construct is doing. Just check if uh, everything is good. Okay. So, <clears throat> of course, it is lambda constructs. It takes two arguments, an any uh, value, could be any number, and a. And you see uh, in how this, this body of the function is defined, this a must be a list, because I use this uh, um, <clears throat> aj. So I, I, iterate, I iterate among the value of the list a by using this uh, variable j. So the a must be a list. Then I use list comprehension for the body of the function. So I put square bracket here. And I construct the list. And how I construct this list, I take uh, the value uh, any, which is I, where I provide as an argument the function. And then I sum this any to all of the value containing the list a indexed by um, this uh, uh, j uh, number. And this j uh, go uh, from 0 to the number of value that I have in a. So I define, I compute the length of a, the, the length of a, the size of a, by using the function len. Then I make range length of a, which provide um, a list of integer number from 0 to the length of a. And j will go from 0 to this uh, list, uh, <clears throat> uh, will run all, all the uh, element of the list uh, returned by the function range. So j will be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. So, on. so we'll take the um, value of a and we'll <clears throat> um, sum this value to the ini and we'll return uh, <clears throat> the result. So I um, assign this function to the function f, to this variable f, that will be a function. Then I call f with uh, this number. Uh, 2 will be the, our any uh, argument, <clears throat> first argument, number 2. And a will be this list. And the result will be obviously the sum of 2 to any of the number here inside. I could write this uh, list comprehension a different way, this way, simpler, uh, for IA, for IA in A. Same list, same results. No, it's not, not the same result. Why? I is not the I, yeah, that's a, I, A, not A, 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 I, so, okay. So, same result as before. <clears throat> you see the difference between uh, this uh, writing and the other one? The other one use um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, an integer number to retrieve the value in the list A, and here I go directly on the, the values contained in the list A. It's simpler. Okay, we have another function here that use um, this construct. <coughs> so uh, this is a definition of the function that I call power. And uh, uh, it accepts an argument which is pow, as is the number, as a keyword argument, that by default can take the, the number 2. And then I use this uh, pow to define um, 
a lambda construct. So I write lambda x colon, is the definition of the anonymous function, and it'll take this x and will return the power um, of x to the power that I provide as input to the power function. So take, for instance, if power is uh, 2, it will return, just return the uh, square of the number x. And what the power function returns is not any value of any any square or any number. It just returns the function, just return the lambda function, which is stored in the number in the in the f. So I uh, run this cell. And now, uh, okay. Now I want to do this thing before I can split cell. Way. I split the two cells this way. Now I run <clears throat> the power function with different argument. I run the power, the power function with no argument. Uh, it means that the number uh, pow will be uh, equal to 2. In this case, I use the default. And now uh, I run also the power function with 3. So this pow argument will be equal to 3. And the result is f2 and 3. So I call the result f2 and 3 and what are f2 and 3 are functions type f2 <coughs> and <coughs> print type f2 and type f3 okay <coughs> okay they are both functions because this power function does not return the power of a number, it returns function, a, a function that will do the power of the function. <clears throat> so I can call the uh, this uh, <clears throat> um, function, for instance, can call f2 and then 3, both function, <clears throat> uh, with an argument which is a list. So I use list comprehension here. Uh, I will run the cells and you tell what happened here. Print y. The result is this one, what I'm doing here. <clears throat> I define a list x, and then I define a list comprehension, so uh, it will be assigned to a variable y. So I start with square bracket, and the sign the square bracket inside the square bracket will put another square bracket with contain <clears throat> um, f2 apply on the argument ix and f3 apply to the argument ix. <laughs> For ix in x, for, for every value ix in the list x here, compute f2 of ix and f3 of ix, put the results in this list, in the form of a list. So I got this uh, um, uh, y is a list of lists, and each sublist contain f2 of ix and f3 of ix, for every ix contained in x. So, <clears throat> 1, square of 1 is 1, this number here. A cube of 1 is 1, so this is all the number here. This is the first list. Then x is equal to 2. Square of 2 is 4, this is number here. The cube of 2 is 8, and this number here. And you have the second list. And so on, so on, till the end of the list. x, 25, 125, which is the cube of 5 and the square of 5. Okay? <clears throat> Without using a list comprehension, we can use uh, NumPy, so we can define the same list x in the form of an array, but just by writing np array and uh, <clears throat> the list. So x will be an array, and then I can call um, y equal np array of f2x and f3f. I don't have to use a list comprehension if I use arrays, numpy arrays. So I run it and I got the same results <clears throat> in the 402 uh, <clears throat> uh, two list. So this is exactly the same result. Written different way, but it's the same result. Okay, now I give you I give you five minutes uh, <clears throat> to understand this code here. This is uh, similar; it's not exactly the same 
as the, 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 the exercise you did yesterday, we did yesterday, of merging files uh, <clears throat> by this time using um, a function definition. Uh, I uh, will want um, uh, a merge function that takes a number of files and merge them in a unique file uh, with some complication. So write a function that takes several file names as arguments. You see uh, we have files, will be a list of possible uh, any number of file names. Uh, there is a star in front of it. Each file containing a variable number of columns. Uh, so the column number in each file can be not only one, can be you can have uh, one column, you have two columns, three columns, and you don't know how many columns are, are in the file. You have to write the code so that uh, uh, the code can handle the situation by using different number of columns. And this uh, number are uh, containing this column are just the floating point data. And <clears throat> all, uh, anyway, all the file must uh, contain the same number of rows, numbers. So the column number can be um, variable, but uh, the number of rows should be fixed uh, in, in every file. Merge them in a unique file containing all of the columns, the original files. And optionally, you may want the data to be sorted according to a specific column, the merged file. So for instance, you have a file containing uh, uh, three columns, and you want to sort um, all the uh, the rows in your merged file according to the uh, uh, order uh, of the uh, second column, for instance, the last file. In that in that file containing three columns. So <clears throat> uh, that's this, that's the problem that you want uh, to solve. You want to write uh, uh, a function that uh, does exactly this. Uh, so look at the uh, reduce the uh, zoom so you can see the bool function. <clears throat> so analyze what this function does and then I will explain you exactly what it's doing. Five minutes.
Okay, I hope that all of you understood what uh, this uh, function does. It's not very difficult. Some parts are identical to uh, what we did yesterday. So, first of all, we have def merge, name, so definition of a function. Merge is the name of the function. Files is a, will be a sequence of a, of a file's name. Um, I will need a path to assess the file. Files can be in the same folder or the function or the, or the script, um, the, num the Python script, or can be elsewhere. Uh, in this case, I can write <clears throat> uh, if the files are in the same um, folder uh, of, the, of the program, the uh, path will be simple. This uh, dot slash means the local folder, or otherwise, I can provide other paths here. The out file, I, I want to write the file, which is a merged out file, can have a, a default name, or otherwise I'm free to choose another name by specifying a different value for this out file argument. So this is a keyword um, argument, just like this uh, path, this is a keyword argument, this out file also a keyword argument. Then I uh, also <clears throat> Um, foresee another possibility. I, I uh, define another keyword argument by default. It is false. In I could use it, for instance, uh, uh, if uh, I want to print on the monitor on the screen um, my data, my merger data, not only in a file which will be stored on the disk, but also um, uh, as an return of the of the functions. So I can use this um, keyword argument out, which is or by default now uh, set to false. And I have this keyword sorting, uh, which is equal to minus one. Now this is a possible choice. Uh, in the in the problem, uh, the test of the problem it says, uh, optionally, we may want the data to be sorted. So optionally means that we can't sort the data or we may not sort the data. So, and I, in case I have to sort the data, I uh, have to um, provide the column number according to which I, I want to sort the data. So a column number can't be a negative number. So if I write here, for instance, sorting equals to minus one, that's for sure this value sorting, if it is equal to minus one, is not a good um, uh, uh, number for indicating a column. So I can use the, the number value minus one to, to, to say to the function that I don't want to sort um, the files. Instead, if sorting is a, as a value which is different from a negative number, just for instance two, then this uh, value will be used to sort the um, uh, my data. That's a possibility. Uh, one can say um, uh, the same thing in a different way. I can, for, uh, for instance, to define another argument which I call sort and say sort equal true. That I will. I want the sort, and then a variable a sort column equal to. I give a number, and that will be the number of the, the column that should be used for sorting. Or otherwise, if I don't want this to sort the data, I can write just sort equal false, and then the other uh, argument number uh, sorting a column, for instance, it is simply could be simply ignored. But this is a way I. I um, don't use two different uh, um, optional arguments to specify if I don't uh, want to sort or if I want to sort and specify the column. Just I use uh, a single uh, parameter, the sorting, that can, as, uh, I can take a number, a negative number. In that case, uh, the sort will not be done. So that's this. Uh, yes. Yeah? I don't, I don't understand uh, how to equal false. What is uh, what? What means? Okay, so go to the end of the, um, uh, the, the the function. You see, if out column return data final. So our data will be stored in a in a variable which is called data final, and this is returned by the function. So if out is false. It will, this, uh, will not be executed. So I will not see anything on the monitor um, of the computer. So the uh, uh, function merge will do, will, does his, uh, will do its job, will merge the columns, 
and will write them in the merge that file. But you will not see anything on the monitor. I will see on the disk the file. Whereas if I put out equal to true, then I, uh, ret I will return some data finals. My variable data final will be returned by the function. And we will see what happened here. For instance, when we'll, uh, we make the, I will make the example uh, data merge, I will call uh, the, this, uh, this function with the out equal to true. And we assign the result, so data final, to our variable data, and we can print the data. So we will see what happened by setting out what equal to true. Is that clear? Uh, yes. OK. Now, I start by defining an array, an empty array at the, at the beginning, NumPy array. I will call it data. Data equal to empty array, and I put uh, empty uh, listing side as argument of the uh, array then i compute the length of files files is our argument which is a star as a star in front of it so it can be a list of files so i can compute end file equal land files how many files i provide here how many files names they will be strings then i start uh, an initial uh, variable which will be the um, the number, of, the total number of columns I have to write in the merge uh, dot, dot file, and I initialize this to zero. Then I start a loop. For I file in files, so for any um, variable of any um, value I files, it can find in the list files here. So it will, it will go through all the file names that I write as input to the, my merge um, uh, function. What to do? Then, construct an, a, a variable I name, which is the sum of the paths, which I provide as default, also different, uh, different value for paths, plus I file. So this will construct an, a string, which contains the file name plus the paths. Then I use the NumPy function loadtxt, to uh, load the file and I will put the um, data in this variable i data this i uh, in front of every variable is a reminder for us uh, for the fact that it's referred to the i file that I uh, which I'm working on in this loop so these are will be the data which you are uh, loaded by the i name files. Then when the loop will go on to the next values, i name will be another name, another file name, and the data will be saved in this uh, uh, variable. Then I look at the number of columns that I have in this um, uh, i data. So the number of columns that I add in the file i name. And I could do it by looking at the dimension of these uh, um, of these uh, i data. This dimension mdim is uh, uh, an attribute to the i data, which is uh, an array, will give us the number of columns that uh, we uh, we have in our um, in our uh, files. And I can um, upgrade the number and column, the total number of columns by the value at the beginning and column at the beginning it was zero plus the number of columns that I read from the file. And now, if I call is equal to one, so if the file contains just one single column, simply append, using the numpy function append, the i data, so my column, the column just one, so I say if the column is just one, just append uh, I data, so my column I read from the file, to data, to the array data here, to the array data that at the beginning was uh, uh, defined as empty. But if the number of columns is not one, so if this test is false, this may be that I column is equal to two, in this case I column uh, two is different from one, and then um, this uh, condition is false, then this uh, instruction will not be executed, and that this is the other set of function that are executed. So if I column is not equal to one, we have another loop here that will be executed. And this loop go to, goes to the, uh, all the possible column 
that I have in my uh, my file. So I define a list of integer number running on all the columns of the file. So if the files contain two columns, I will have here range I call that will give us a list of two numbers, integer numbers 0 and 1. And this J call we go from 0 and 1. So first value of J call will be 0. Then uh, uh, takes this I data, which has been read by low txt, and look for the column 0. This is a slicing. So takes all the value contained in the column 0. All the values is specified by the fact that I put a column here. J call will be 0, so it will re refer to the first column. Put the results uh, of this slicing in the variable ix, and then append ix, this column, on the array data. Then the loop goes on. They say, all right, now J call um, takes the, the next value, will be 1. So the, I will have i data uh, sliced with a column here, so all the data along the column. And the column will be the second column indexed by j call equal to 1. Save the data in ix and append ix to data. So at the end, I will have all the, uh, of the, the first this loop and of this loop, I will have this data file, this data, not data file, this data array, which contain in sequence all of the columns that are uh, read uh, from the um, all of the files. Then I look at the size of the uh, this array and I will compute. So I, I I look the size and data is an empire array. An empire array has an attribute which is called size. So data size is the number of elements which are contained in data. And I store this number in length data. So how, my, how many data I have in my um, in my array data, which is just a single list of all the possible numbers. Then I compute the rows. The rows, uh, I don't know how many rows there are in any uh, in, in my data files, but I compute the rows because I know the number of columns. The number of columns has been computed because every time that I read a file, I upgrade the number of columns in the in the variable and call. So at the end of the loop, the, the two loops, I know how many columns I have read. So I can take the length of the data divided by the number of columns. I, I make sure that to, to have an integer number. So I, I this this uh, length data uh, over uh, divided by n call will be an integer number, but will be treated by uh, the interpreter as a floating point number. Maybe th that you have, a, uh, let's say, 20, 20 rows. It will not calculate 20. It will calculate 20 dots. So this 20 dot will be a floating number. That could be a problem because we, can, we should use this n row variable, the number of, of, uh, uh, of row, as an integer number because I want to use it in a reshape method of the data array. We'll see in a minute. So I want this n row to be an integer number. Even if, if it seems an integer number, it is not because in this division here will provide us a floating point number. So I convert this floating point number into an integer, in integer type, by using the int function. So divide the number, the total number of data that you have by the number of columns, and you will have, of course, the number of rows. So I have the column, the number of columns, and I have the number of rows. Then I can reshape my data in an array, in two-dimensional array, containing n row and n column. Now, I, this number, I know what they are. The, 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 the function merged them, computed them the, the way before. Then reshape the data and store the results in the data final. So data final is a variable, which is an umpire a, 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 a array, having n row and n column. OK, now uh, I look for sorting. So <clears throat> um, if I don't want sorting, I, uh, I use the default value minus 1 for the variable sorting. And 
Here the codes is look like that. If sorting is not equal to minus one, so I want to sort. Uh, if it is equal to minus one, then uh, this test will be false. If this uh, sorting would be equal to minus one, I will have minus one not equal to minus one. That's false. So this uh, series of uh, uh, instruction indented under the if uh, statement will not be executed. But if sorting is, for instance, equal to two or three or something like that, then 2 will not be equal to minus 1, and so this test is true, and so all these, function, all these instructions here will be executed. So if sorting as a, a different number, maybe it is, it should, it is not minus 1, it should, it should take uh, the column number for which I want to sort. So, for instance, uh, maybe the sorting is equal to 2, or in this case, in the example, sorting is equal to 3, when I will call the function. So, sorting is equal to 3. When, uh, then, store the value of sorting the variable e I call. Then, look uh, to the data which are contained in data find our array um, in, uh, uh, with every index I call. So, I, I will... Uh, uh, take my data final, and I will extract the data contained in the column I call. And I will put the, um, uh, this data in uh, uh, the variable call. So this will be an, a one-dimensional array containing the data, containing the column I call of data final. Then I sort the value by using... Uh, the function arc sort. So I don't sort exactly here in this instruction the value which are contained in uh, um, in the call, but I want uh, the position of the element uh, correctly sorted. So I look for the position uh, by using the function arc sort. We saw that the function arc sort at the, the first uh, lecture. Just to be clear. If I, for instance, I write call equal to uh, 2, 3, 1, uh, 4. So this is our call. And now I want arc sort. I call arc sort here. And I call pause equal to mp arc sort of call. Okay, now I write pause, okay, call pause. So what you get? We did it in the, la in the first lecture, and I, I, that's a reminder. So I have this call. I have a call contained 2, 3, 1, 4. It is not uh, sorted. The lowest number in call is the number 1. And it is the position, which is 0, 1, 2, second position. So, pause contain the first position, the two. So, contain the index of the lowest number in the score uh, um, list. Then the second number is zero. This two here in the index, this, the, 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 this position here, the first position, the call array. And in, in, indeed, this two is greater than one, but it's more than, than the other value here. So, the second element in this. Uh, uh, um, Array, which is uh, could be must should be sorted is two. Then the next number to be to be sorted is three. Three occupy the position one, index one zero one. So you write here this way. And the last one is the fourth, uh, which is the largest element in the list, and it occupy the position three. By the way, if I write call, pause. Why the level integers can be converted to scalar integers? So, pause is that, call is this. 
Oh yes, yes. Call should be uh, an, an, an umpire. So. Mm. Okay. Okay. I have to convert this pause in an umpire, uh, this call in an umpire array. So I select the value of call according to the pause value, so according to the position and uh, of the sorted array, and I get the sorted arrays. If I do the same here. In this way, so I call arc pause on the call, on the column, which is indeed an umpire array, a one-dimensional umpire array. I store the position of the sort element in the pause call, so the position of the sort element. And then for all the other columns, for all the columns indeed, that I have in my data uh, final, I make the sort. So um, data final, I reassign data final. In this loop, data final I see, so I, I, I start a, a for loop uh, for all the column that I have in my data final, for I see in range and calls on the number of columns I have. And so I, so I start by, to say, all right, data final I see, the, the, value, the initial value I see will be zero for the first column of the file, equal to data final first column post call so i i, I use the, the position saved in post call the sorted position to um, uh, select data in the proper way the sorted way and i assign the value in data final then i see it equal to two uh, to click to zero one two three four and all this the column of the data file will be um, will be sorted according to this position saved here Okay, now data final will contain our data sorted in the proper way according to the column I specified in, a, in, the, in the input here by sorting, by the sorting keyword. Now I want, for instance, data for out, uh, data that must be saved in, the, in, our in our file, and I want them written in a way which a human can understand. So I uh, First of all, reshape my data final uh, in this way by specifying the number of columns, the number of rows. So I reshape the, uh, the arrays, and then I transpose it. Um, then I uh, construct the outer file um, uh, where I want to write my, my final data uh, in, um, on the disk by appending the, the the, the out file name to the paths. So I out name will be the name uh, of the out file uh, path comprised. And then I save the file uh, with uh, save txt, the numpy function save txt. Out name save txt will take uh, an argument which is the, the, the file, the name, the name of the file, which is the out name. Data for out, so the data that I want to output. And the format, I want that they, um, this number will be formatted as floating point number by using three digits. And if out is true, then return data final. So I want to see the data uh, printed um, in, my, in my screen. So I have here data merge file 1 dot, file 2 dot, file 3 dot, and file 4 dot. We can go to see these files. They are the same as, as the last the last time we for instance 501 dot contain just uh, one column of data. Close the other, contain just one column of data. The same is true for file two, file three, but file four is this new one that I want to merge also. And file four which contain two columns, that's just one. So I have these three files, three files containing one column, so three columns in total, plus two columns from this file, four. So I, at the end, I will have five columns to be merged. I want uh, to, uh, to see the results of my monitor. And I want to sort the data by column three. So the column three will be the column 
uh, uh, which is read from the file file tree. File tree probably is not written as sorted sorted value. So file tree is this one. Okay, this is already uh, in sorted, but anyway. Then I run it. Name merge is not defined because I have to, to, to run this cell before. Okay, so I saved the files, first of all, files as being saved in merge point dot. This is the file. And I saved the results also in the data um, uh, array. Okay, so I can print the data and, and can see the results here. If I put out equal to false, I wouldn't get any results here. Data would be known. For instance, if I write here out equal to false, I make the sorting. Now I try to print data. I will get known because this function will not return anything. The function will save the files, the merged file in the disk, but will not return anything because out is false, this instruction is not executed, and so the function return known. If I, and this known will be assigned to the variable data, and if I print data, this result is simply known. Okay, so these are. data could be useful to have. Okay, any question? Do you understood the, 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 all the reasoning here behind these functions? Maybe a little bit. I have a more general question yeah? about uh, sort and arg sort. Yeah. Because in the end, they do the same, right? The final well, result. they sort, but they do not uh, uh, return the same things. They okay. return different things. So, tell the question. So, when it's more convenient to use sort and when arg sort? Well, <clears throat> Uh, simple example, you make x equal to np array and uh, uh, you put a list of number, for instance, uh, minus 2. Uh, let's do some different things. Use np link space from minus 2 to uh, 2, and uh, I want, uh, let's say, 30 now. So look at print x. I generated by a function link space, I generated 30 numbers from minus 2 to 2, and I put the result in x. Then I write y equal to x cube plus uh, 2x square, 2 times x square minus uh, 3, for instance, minus 2. Okay. Okay. Then print y. You have this computation. Now you want to see a plot. So I import uh, matplotlib pyplot splt. Then I want to plot the result. So I say plt plot x and y. Okay, this is the um, the plot in this range, and you see that I have a minimum, for instance, uh, of my function around uh, zero, between zero and zero five. 
Okay, so what I can do, okay, I can redefine, for instance, X. This is just uh, a little complication here. I did define the list X in this way. I, I want to avoid the, to, to have this, uh, this region here, which uh, uh, where the function goes down. But so, so I can write in beaming space, copy and paste here. And we start from let's minus one. Okay. And then again I compute uh, this y here. Okay, now we have our y and we have our x. And if I do the plot I get the same uh, the similar picture as before, just to be sure. Okay, this is our plot. You have this minimum values. If I now I want the minimum, the position at the minimum, I want the x here for which the y is minimum. If I compute, for instance, um, the minimum of um, y, I got this number. No? Now, this mean function is uh, a function which works this in the same way as the sort function does. So I explain to you what a, a, a slightly different thing, but um, sort and minimum works in exactly the same way. Simple minimum, we return the first element of a sorted array, uh, the first element of a sorted array. But essentially, it does the same thing as sort. But I'm generally not interested in, in finding the value of y at which, uh, uh, the value of y at the minimum. I want to know the x at which the, um, uh, the, the y is minimum. So instead of using min, I use argmin. So I write np argmin y. And I got a number. That's the index in the array of y for which y is minimum. And I use this y, this, this uh, I mean y, so this, I use this 10, to retrieve the value of x at which the uh, y is minimum. So I write here 10. And I got this number. This is the value of x at which the, um, the y is minimum. The same thing is for sort. Uh, I sort the, uh, the, my list, for instance, I can sort the, uh, the y, mp sort uh, y. I have to use this parenthesis. And I got my um, array y, which is being sorted from the minimum value to the maximum one. And you see the minimum values is this uh, number that uh, we got using the function mean. But I don't want, in this case, for instance, in this example, the position, um, I don't want the sorted value of y. I want to know the value of x for which y assume this value sort in this way. So what I can do, I can write uh, position equal to np arg sort. y. So I have this position, I have the index, this index here. So the minimum value of y is this number here, and it, it is in the position 10, and I use, and then, then the next uh, value is uh, minus 1 dot uh, 9908, so, and it is in position 9, so on. And I use this position to retrieve the value of x for which y is sorted in this way. So I can write x plus, and I got this. So you see the difference? Yeah, yeah. Okay. In this case, in the example here, I use this pos. Where? 
this pause call to sort uh, the um, all of the columns in the, in the, in our merged file according to the sorting so the position of the sorting in a specific column i want to sort according to the position to the column call which i call call and so i get the the the, the, the position uh, of the element inside the um, the column sorted in the way i want and then i use this post call on all, all the other columns in the file to to get all the columns sorted according to the column i selected okay any other question sorry delete all this Okay, if there are no other questions, I will start uh, uh, the next notebook, which is variable scoping. Then uh, I will start now, then we'll finish this afternoon. Namespace and variable scoping. It is one of the most tricky aspects of Python. Uh, there are many tricky aspects. This is one. Uh, um, Always um, is origin of a lot of confusion when uh, you write uh, uh, programs by yourself as a be as beginner, but not only as beginner. Even if uh, we have you, you get some experience, you get some experience in programming. There are always problems when uh, uh, the variable scoping is uh, um, is an issue. So <clears throat> now we'll see what, what is it. Now look at this cell. It's very very simple. Um, simple. The example is simple, but uh, the uh, the the message is not that simple. So, this cell I uh, define uh, a variable a, which is a equal to one. Then I define a function here. I, my function I call without any argument, and inside the function I redefine a a equal to twenty. Then I print this uh, uh, message, print of a within the function, and the, the function uh, the, the value will be printed. Then the function uh, finish here. Here is the body of the function. Then what I do now? I uh, write, I print uh, the variable a is defined outside the function before the function in this is invoked. So. Uh, Take care. When I define the function, I do not execute the function. Here in this code, in these first lines, I define a variable outside of the function. Then I define the function. Then I do something else. So when the interpreter goes through this, uh, um, this, uh, this cell, the first thing uh, the, uh, it uh, will do is define this variable A. Then we read the definition of the function and stop it. So the, just the definition of the function. Then we'll proceed to printing this message. Then we'll call the function. And then we'll reprint this message, the variable a, after the function is invoked. Now around the, 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 this, uh, this cell, and you will see. The variable a is defined outside the function. Is this message here? The print part. Then go to this next line. There is a slash n. Before the function is invoked, is invoked. Before the function is invoked, is a. This is a equal to one. Now, call the function. What does the function? We define the, fun the variable a to 20 and print the message print of a within the function and then print the number. Print of a within the function. Up to now, no problem, no, no strange things. After all, a is being redefined here. And uh, so the value of a at the time of the print instruction is executed is 20. So 
print away within the function 20. Nothing strange. Then you may say, all right, now the function uh, changed the value of a to 20. So when the function exits and I uh, print the variable after the function is invoked, outside the function, and you see that the value is again 1. So what's happened here? The function has not changed the value of a. I redefined the value of a to be 20. But at the end of the function, when the function exits, I get the same value as before for a. 1. What happened? Well, what happened is this. This, fun, this variable a is defined in the main module of the, of the program. The main module is simply the cell in this case. It is the variable defined in the in the environment. It is said that it is defined at the level of the global namespace. So uh, our very little script is a program, is a module, and it has na a namespace, and there's a global namespace, and I define a value of A, I define the variable A in the global namespace. When I call the function, the function uh, defines its own namespace. So when I write a equal to 20 here, this variable a has nothing to do with the variable a defined in the global namespace. It's another thing. It points to another position in the memory of the computer, something different. That's a local namespace. It's a namespace which is defined within the function. The function, when you call the function, define its own namespace. So you have this A, there's nothing to do with this A here, and the print message here will, uh, will uh, write the value of the function of the local namespace, so it will write 20. When the function exits, so finish the, you call the function, then the function returns something. In this case, the function returns known. There is no return uh, value of the function. The function exits. All the local variables are destroyed. There are no more local variables. The local variable we have the function defined. And A now are the uh, outside the function is the, the A that I defined it before in the global namespace. And so when I print it, the value is one. It is untouched because it's a different thing from the A I got here. That's one one mess. That's very difficult to understand this one. You have to understand that the function has its local namespace, and every variable defined in the local namespace uh, is deleted after the function is executed. Now <clears throat> let's uh, look at this other function here. Do you understood this one, this uh, this cell? Uh, yes, um, I have a question about yeah. that. Uh, what happens if now uh, we call back again the function? Do we need to again define a new a within the function, or a is? Of uh, course, function? yes, yes. When the function exit, the 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 the, the, um, the function exit the. Um, Local namespace is deleted, so the function does not remember uh, this value of a. Okay. But if I call again the function anyway, the function the, the, the function will redefine again a. So uh, this a equal twenty is defined inside the function. So if I call the function again, it is the function that call uh, the define again this a to to twenty. Ah, okay. 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 Good. Yes. Now. <clears throat> Similar example, but you see, a equal to one, so a variable defined in the in the global at the global level. Then I have my function. I call b equal to twenty, so I in the function define the variable b equal to twenty, and will print a, and then b, then exit. But wait a moment. I said the function here. Now now we, now we run it, and you see what's result.
The interpreter defined the value a equal to 1, then define the function. We read this definition. We'll not execute the function at this moment, just read the function. Then print this message. The variable a defined inside the function before the function is invoked is a, is a here, is 1. So these two lines are written by this message, by this instruction here, outside the function. Then the function is invoked, and these two uh, print uh, instructions will be executed after the B has been defined. The print of A within the function, 1. Print of A within the function, 1. The value that I have at the, uh, at the global level. The print of B within the function, B, is 20. It's OK. So, what's the message here? The variable a that was defined at the global level filtered inside the function. And unless the function redefines it as that happened here, the function knows the value of a at the global level. So the value a is known by the function. And so it uh, prints the value 1. So this, this variable a is, is a variable defined at the global level, and the function known its values, uh, <clears throat> unless it is this variable is redefined. So we can also say that in this case, like in a case like this, the variable a, the global variable a, is shadowed by a local variable inside defined inside the function. So the function will no longer see this value here. It will see the value 20, and this variable a will shadow the global variable a. In this case, there is no shadowing, because I do not redefine the variable a inside the function. And so the function knows there exists um, uh, a variable a at the global level, and will print it correctly. P is a local variable, it is defined inside the function, doesn't exist at the global level, but exists inside the function, and the, the function will print it. So print of A within the function is 1, print of B within the function is 20. Now, we define A at the global level, we define B at the local level. I, if I print A, I get 1. I am still in the global level when now when I this cell I uh, the, the the environment preserve all the global variables which are defined in the previous modules. But what if I if I ask for B? Now I am the global level, I ask for B. I get an error. B is not defined. It's not defined because B was defined inside. The function, so in the local namespace of the function, when the function exits, I call the function, then the function returns exit. The variable inside the function will be deleted, the local uh, namespace are deleted, and so B is no longer defined. A was defined at the global level, it's preserved, but B is not defined. Okay. Now, here... Uh, I look for uh, the, just a technical uh, cell here to, to proceed in the example. Uh, I don't want to a to be defined at a global level to see what happened next. And uh, so I look if a is in globals, the, the, the function globals will give you all the globals variables which are currently defined in our um, um, environment. If I uh, run globals here, Globals. It's a function. I got all the, the 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 global variables which are defined in the in the in the, the environment. And you see, there are no only variables. There are all sorts of things. There are um, print. Uh, there are anything which has been uh, um, used in the previous cells uh, uh, stored as global variables inside the environment. Now, what I do here, now print P, well, okay, delete this cell. 
I will search for the variable a, for the string a in globals, and if present, delete it. Okay, sorry. Okay, now a is no longer defined in the, in the, in the, in the global environment. In fact, if I try now to print a, I got an error because I delete this variable a. Now, I define a function inside a function. I define a nested function. So I have a, a func1 with no argument. This func1 define a variable a, then print one parenthesis value of a. Then inside the func1, there is an, a definition of another variable with same same name, a equal to 20, print 2, parentheses, value of a. Then func, func1, after having defined func2 inside, call func2 and print the value of a. 3, parentheses, value of a. So let's see what happened. Now I just defining the function one, func one. I didn't execute yet. I want to see what happened when I execute func one. One twenty one. So what happened? A equal to one. Func one define a and put the value to one and print one a. One a. The value of a is one. Then the func2 is defined, and the function func1, after defi defining the func2 function, will execute it. And what happened when it will execute it? a equal to 20, so a definition, and print to a. This print here, this 220, is the result of this printing here. 220. Then the function func2 exit and func1 proceeds over to print 3a and the a is 1. Again, as before, we have a um, equal to 1 defined in the main, uh, in the namespace of func1 is equal to 1. The a which I defined here is shadowing the a defined to here. Reassign the value a to 20. Well, it, it, it does not reassign the value. It defines a new value in the namespace of func2 and assign it to the value of 20 and then print the results. Then func2 ends. The control uh, is returned to func1. That prints a. And a, a refer, to which func1 refers to is the is a1 here. So the result is 3, 1. So this, again as before, func2 shadow the value of the variable a, which is a local variable in the func1 namespace. It is not a global variable as before, you say. It is a local variable, but it is, is used in this namespace of func1. Now, if I want to print a, I will get an error. Because, as I told you, this A is defined in the namespace of func1. If, when func1 finished, exit, the namespace is deleted, is destroyed. So there is no any uh, a global variable called A, and uh, I got an error, A is not defined. Just as before, but to see, to, 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 to show the, this, uh, this other example, uh, maybe that okay. That works in the same way as before for global variable. It's the same rule uh, uh, are enforced even for function defined within functions. By the way, if, if I write here b equal to n t, and then I print. Uh, two bis, and then I give some space. B. 
So I define the function this way and I call func1. You see what happened. The variable a, the file namespace of func1, unless it is, it is shadowed within func2, and it is not shadowed in this case, is seen by func2, which is defined within func1. So I got, I defined the variable b, the local function inside func2, and I, uh, yeah, I have this printing here, print 2 a. A is not defined in func2, but this is defined in func1. It is seen. It is the value a equal to 1 filters inside namespace of func2, and it is printed. So it exists, it is printed currently. 2 bis 20, this one is b, the value of b defined in func2. And then I um, uh, have the last message here. Now, if I write here, if I still modify the script in this way, I want the variable b, for instance, uh, just print b. I got an error because now b is defined within func2 uh, uh, in the namespace of func2. It is destroyed when func2 exit, and so func1 ignores the value of b. There is no b. There is no longer b defined in the namespace of func1, and so you got an error. b is not defined. That's okay. It goes low on this point because it's tricky. It seems uh, clear, but when you will start to work alone, uh, you will encounter a problem like this one. So, take home message. Variables defined in the main module are global. They can be seen in every function defined in the same module, unless they are shadowed by variables defined inside the function that share the same label. So you have two variables, uh, different variable, for instance, at the beginning, here, a1 and a, and a here. They share the same value, but they are not the same variable. One is a global variable, the other one is a local variable. Variables defined inside the function can be seen in all of the nested subfunctions defined in that function, unless shadow it. This message, this, uh, this example here. We have nested function. Now, uh, I will illustrate you this example, then, uh, then, uh, then we'll, we will stop for, for this morning. I define a name, a function with no good name, so probably this function will not work currently. Def no good, no uh, argument, uh, no optional, no mandatory argument. In this function, I define uh, uh, first a counter, counter equal to one. So a variable I call counter, and I can print the value of counter. The beginning will be equal to one. Then inside no good, I define a nested function, I call it nested func. They take the value counter plus one. So I upgrade the value of the counter by taking counter plus one and print the value. Then, after I define this nested function, the function no good will call it, will call the nested function. And you can say, all right, that's no, no bad, can work, because I defined this counter equal to one. Then I said that the, the variable which are defined in the namespace of this function no good, unless shadowed, should be seen in the nested function. And you see that, all right, this seems to be a shadowing, but after all, uh, I define this counter variable inside the nested function, so inside the local namespace of nested func, by using the value counter, which is defined before, in the, in the in the outer space, in the now in gen more general namespace of the of the function no good. So, what one could uh, expect to see from calling this function no good? Counter is equal to one. Counter filter inside the nested function. So I get counter equal counter plus one. So uh, at the end of the of the uh, nested function counter should be two. 
I can print counter. So let's see what happened. At the problem, at the time of the, of the definition, the, 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 the function definition, you have no error. That's perfect. The interpreter is happy. No problem. Then you call the function. Ah, you get an error. Local variable counter reference before assigned. Hey, wait a minute. I define counter. And I use counter here. So why uh, I got an error message, local variable counter reference before assignment. I want to use the, fun the, 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 the variable before I assign a value to, the, this, this variable, to, a value to this variable. I provide the value to the variable. So why I have this error message? You have this error message because I have counter equal to. So inside the nested function, when the interpreter sees an expression like this, before computing it, out automatically shadow the value uh, of this function, of this variable here. So the, 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 the interpreter forgets for the value in counter equal to one, defined in the namespace of no good, and define a new variable. And this variable is, co is, is called counter in the namespace of nest func. Then try to evaluate this counter by making equal to counter plus one. But counter is not still defined inside this namespace because I shadowed the value here defined in the, in the other namespace, in the, in the outside, in the outer namespace. So the interpreter is not able to make this computation because does not the, the, does not know the value of counter because the counter here I repeat again this value the, the variable defined written here in exactly this position is not the variable that is written here is the new variable counter that is been um, shadowing the the, 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 <coughs> the counter defined here the counter defined here and so say all right but you are trying to use uh, the variable counter before assignment so I can, I can calculate this expression if I know what I don't know what is the value of counter is so you get an error so no good define this function and then call nest function and you, provide, uh, you get you an error now, this is good. This function is good. It does something else. The function is good. It will work. Uh, define a counter equal to 1. Print the value of the counter. Then define nest function. And define a new variable. Counter 2. This counter 2 equal to counter plus 1. Does not shadow the variable counter written here. There is no shadow in this case. So the value of counter written here in this position is no, is just equal to one. And so counter two can be computed and then printed. So it's good, define the function nest func, and then execute it. Now I run the cell, I run the function, and I got the result. Counter one uh, counters, the first message here is this from this uh, Printing extraction here is one. Counter two, this new variable is printed here and is equal to two, just being upgraded to two. But this is not the same thing as before. It's not probably the, the thing that you want to do. For instance, you, you uh, uh, would like to have, maybe in some example, to have a function that counts how many times a function is called. And then you should have a global um, counter variable uh, that's, that is upgraded every time. But here, uh, uh, this uh, counter two variables is not a variable. It is not uh, the counter variable that you would like to use. And so this function is good, works, but does not what you want generally. Define a new, a new a variable that, by the way, will be destroyed um, in, the, in, the, in the namespace of is good. Uh, by the time that uh, the nested function is executed and exit. Okay, now I uh, stop. If you have questions, of course, you can ask. 
Uh, this afternoon we'll continue on this, uh, this problem and we'll see solution, possible strategies to work with this uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, type of problem. Of course, if you don't understand uh, this point, it is very important. Uh, think about it uh, during the lunch, if you have time. And then uh, at the beginning of the, the, the session, this afternoon session, ask me all your problems. So we'll try to solve it. Okay. So questions so far? So if there are no questions, we'll see in uh, at two o'clock. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. See you later. Yeah. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you.